Hello, everybody, and welcome to this episode of the Dr. Keith Darrow podcast, available wherever podcasts are available, Spotify, Apple, also on YouTube. I am, I really, I consider myself blessed today to have with us a, a prolific musician, composer, author, and frankly, uh, Frank, if you don't mind me saying, I, I think you're a pretty cool dude. I've been following your work. I've been you know, dabbling in some of your books and, and you're just, you seem like one of these down to earth, cool guys that I'd love to, you know, share a coffee or a beer with one day. So thank you for being here. Well, well it'd be great uh, on the podcast. We can't share either, but we can share, we can get into some deep dialogue and share exactly, some good, exactly. good time for the audience. <laughs> so I appreciate being here as well. I'm glad to be no, here. No, no, no. Thank you. Thank you for all you do, because I think that, you know, what, what, before I really dive into sort of your vast knowledge uh, and, and your, I think it's not only vast knowledge, but I think it's your very unique outlook on hearing loss on technology. I want to sort of, I want to pause, I, I, you know, I want to come back to that. I really want to focus on what I think is your your most recent release, which is Amplified, right? This is this is a book all about unleashing the power of of potential through through music. I I mentioned to this to you before. I think there's something in me that does connect deeply with music. I think I'm super productive when I go sit at a cafe and I listen to music. I get a ton of stuff done. So, you know, it's something that's always intrigued me, but you've really brought it to the forefront. So, so, you know, thank you for for the book and and what what brought you to do that? What is your what is your why? I guess let's start there, Frank. All right, Keith. Well, it's it's uh, the why as it relates to the the music and you know some of what we're talking about today is to transform the world, um, understands and experiences and uses music in their lives um, for their well being for their benefit to optimize their human potential. So that's a, a long why, but that's and I you know can tell you why we got how we got how we got there. What are, what are those? I mean, what do those words mean? Like deep down, uh, trying to, I mean, those are those are big words. Those are big concepts. Change, right? Change the world through music is sort of the summary. I mean, how does one go about that? Well, I mean, let's just go to the you know a little back up a little bit to the basics of why, um, you know, what we're taught about music. So and what what we're missing. So you know, over the last five hundred years of what the developed of Western civilization, we've basically been taught. We've narrowed our perception around music, and this affects hearing and what, what use, we use our ears for, but primarily we've narrowed our perception around music into two lanes, um, which is performance and entertainment. So that means we remove health, we remove education, remove brain development as a child and, and as an adult. We remove all these health and wellness aspects. We remove these of capacity, using it as the capacity that you just mentioned you use for yourself to focus um we're so we're no longer taught these things you know we don't go into school and learn you know even if you learn music appreciation that's the most popular music course for college freshmen you learn you know you study the you know the, the great male composers of the 16th 17th 18th 19th century you know and their works but you don't what do you really learn about how you can use music as this integral tool and sound as well is this integral tool in your life every day to be a more fully actualized human being. So that, so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about unleashing power. I mean, I, I had a chuckle in the back of my head when you talked about that, that music appreciation class, the one that, you know, by the time you get to a senior and you realize, oh, wait, I forgot my music or my creative arts class. I got to go sit through this 100 class. This will be my my easy course for the semester. Um, and I, I, you know, I look back, I'm, I'm kind of bummed that I, 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 I didn't, I've played, I've dabbled with drums, acoustic guitar, but it was never, it wasn't in my school system. It wasn't something that was really, you know, pushed. It was just... I, it was a, a an interest I had, but it was never really taught to us. I feel like you must have some view on when we should really start to learn about music and its power, not just through some you know music one hundred course in college that we're forced to take. Well, you know, people 
ask me all the time, especially parents, how early they should, you know, teach your kids learn about music. And I, and I, and I think it's more about being conscious of what music can do and as much as it is teaching it to them, um, being a conscious of what music and sound can do is as early as in the, in the, you know, in the uterus, you know, it's, um, so, and then at every stage of life thereafter. So, you know, the ears develop fairly early in the human development Very early. and Absolutely. <laughs> really early in the womb. And, um, and sound is the primary connection, obviously, because the child can't see um, anything. And, and by the time the child's known, uh, born, it knows the sound of its parents' voices. It knows the sound of what's been going on in its environment. It's familiar with these things and sound, you know, I, I'm bringing it into sound a little bit because it's, um, you know, I know a lot of your audience is in the hearing space, but, you know, how do we bring this, these two worlds together? You know, sound is our key line of defense for the brain and the limbic brain, the older reptilian brain is. So understanding how our ears relate to the, what we, what we put into them and how powerful music is as a resource to put it in to do what we want our brain and our system to do because it responds with, you know, specific neurotransmitters, respects to specific areas of the brain, specific triggers to functionality and, and emotions. And so I don't think there's an, too early and I don't think there's a too late. <laughs> as, long as, we have as long as we have neuroplasticity and we can, and even beyond if we can actually hear with our ears. I think you might be reading my notes because you literally just brought up the word that I wanted to ask you about, about the neuroplasticity. So, so one of the cool things that you start to get into in your book is the concept of music actually rewiring, right? These are your words, rewiring the brain. I mean, what's, what, what do you know about this? What's the research that's out there? I, I'll be completely honest with you. I'm a, I'm a PhD geek, uh, but, but music was something that I, I've never really researched. I haven't, I don't know much about how music influences the brain. So I, I'm coming to you uh, to be the expert on this. Right. And, and, and I have to say that th those words, actually the rewiring of the brain came from one of my lead neuroscientists who's, who's got teams of about 150 neuroscientists and yeah, doctors yeah. around the world. So it's, uh, I didn't, own, I don't own those, but the, um, Oh no, no, no. I understand that. But, but it's let's just, go, I mean, so let's go, let's, yeah, let's go. I'm, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Keith. Anyway. No, t tell me, I mean, tell me about the data. Tell me about what, you know, what has this team of, of neuroscientists really taught you about the power of music and rewiring the brain? Because I mean, the, the plasticity is real and it doesn't stop. Right. I mean, it, right. Yes. There's that old saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. Yes, you can, right? The neuroplasticity, the rewiring never stops. It's right. just, maybe it's a little bit harder. Maybe it takes a little bit extra effort when we get older, but but we are, our brain is influenced every day and it changes every day. And so tell me more about the changes in terms of, and how music can, can really change that or, or provide that impetus for change. Right. And we can also do that, you know, I'll go a little bit with it with music, but we can also bring it back to sound. So how we perceive and relate to sound, how it we condition our brain to then perceive and relate to how we relate to the world and sound. <clears throat> but from, you know, basically, if you look at, I mean, I'm going to go to the other end of the spectrum now, you know, the aging, cognitive decline. So, and just to give you some examples of, you know, you've, you know, music takes place in the brain and more, you know, it triggers that we could say, or it stimulates more areas of the brain than any other known stimuli. And so because of that, it, it, it activates in more areas of the brain so that they have to connect and communicate with other, each other to give a full picture of what's coming in. Right. And, and the reason that that has certain values, if we look at things like memory, um, you know, when we look at cognitive decline, for example, you know, we look at certain areas of the brain will get, damaged by things like dementia or, or Alzheimer and certain areas of the brain, but the, but music is re certain areas of the memory, we say, so the memory section, but certain areas of the brain retain memory um, of music in multiple areas of the brain that don't get damaged by the disease. Mm -hmm. So because of that, the brain has this capacity when we re-trigger these, these memories, we re-trigger these memory centers 
based on things that have been stored there through the combination of emotional intensity and and sound and and uh, information <laughs> or music, you know, which music has all this in it. Um, they can the brain has a capacity to bring those pieces back together and become present in a way that it wouldn't otherwise be able to. So that's so, not necessarily telling us we're going to rewire the brain, you know, immediately or change things, but it means that we've wired the brain in a certain way to identify and relate exactly. to those things that we wouldn't have, that we couldn't have done with photographs or someone's face or uh, reading or something like that. Exactly. <laughs> my my little my little analogy that goes along with what you're saying is: look, you can close your eyes, you cannot close your ears, <laughs> and you you we already discussed it. You start right. hearing in utero you're hearing right. in the womb and so right. hearing literally influences every single part of the brain right and so to me the links of hearing loss and cognitive decline and dementia they make perfect sense because if you lose this sense that has been stimulating the brain for 50 60 70 years it's going to cause massive changes in the brain if left unaddressed and untreated and so that's why, you know, we come to understand that untreated hearing loss can really increase the risk of dementia by as much as nearly 200 to 500 percent. And it just it makes sense because of how important sound is to stimulating the entire brain. And I love your you're talking about music. So in addition to my role as a clinical audiologist and a neuroscientist, I'm a certified dementia practitioner. And so I understand a lot about the decline process. And one of the most fascinating things in patients is, look, they might not recognize you. If we're talking about a patient with late stage dementia, put on music, though, and they become a different person. They, they can almost revert right. back to some of those times when they were younger. And, and it, it, it brings back all these memories to the person who is otherwise seemingly you know, lost their memory. It's it's a fascinating process. Uh, yeah, and I commend you for that work. It's brilliant work. It, you know, fortunately, it's getting a bit of a spotlight, fortunately or unfortunately, because Tony Bennett now. But, um, you know, it's nice to see, yeah. you know, the public eye come a little bit into the area of dementia and, 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 and Alzheimer's. Um, you know, and part of this is in the, with music, um, you know, sound is, is, you know, music is just a comp very complex, um, use of sound, in a way, right? Because, well, yeah. you know, so you're, we're adding different, many different aspects that are triggering more areas of the brain than a specific sound or specific right. voice. It's very because, different you know, than <laughs> speech, right? It's got, it has right. so much more depth and richness that, right? I mean, if, if from what I know of the brain studying it for over 20 years, it's, it's pretty simple to say most of the language is on the left side, right? But when you listen to music, you're getting the language components and the musical components that activates the right side. So undeniably, music is going to activate more than just the spoken word. Yeah, and the motor cortex and, you know, many other different areas that um, that you might not get specifically with sound treatment, which is, not, you know, has a lot of different specific uses in itself. Yes. And then in terms of the development of those areas of the brain and why you see in your in your patients or you know in your work those reactions is you know it's all, it's almost always going to be the music that happens in the most formative years of the neuroplasticity of the brain not so much in the really early formative years like you know 0 to 7 but um in those in those highly emotionalized um years between 11 12 and say 21 so almost everybody you, you, you tend to find if you want to see what music is going to bring back those memories um, or re-stimulate those areas of the brain, you just go, even if they don't know, you can kind of go to the music history between when they were 12 and when they were 20. I, I got to tell you, you know, I have this, I don't know if you can see the big smirk on my face, but you just, you literally just explained to me why I default to Motley Crue from the eighties, because my formative <laughs> years, <laughs> I've always, I mean, I love the Beatles. I love, but if I'm going right. to go back to something, it's going to be during those formative years. And then there's the music that, that brings forth the memories of the, the college formative years, all of that. So that's right. a, a beautiful way to explain it, Frank. And part of that is when we look again at the neuroscience of the brain or the, you know, the way the, the, the human system works at the intersection. So, mem you know, memories are most, um, deeply stored if they're associated with emotion, right? So 
you know, so you have high emotional, high hormonal states <laughs> combined with, you know, high neuroplasticity and development combined with, um, you know, this complex and highly emotionally charged music that's, that's stimulating all these physical moves, all these hormones, all these, you know, all these states of the areas of the brain. And that's, you know, and you add falling in love or falling out of love or, you know, or your, your best friend or, you know, any life moving things. And you add that complex set of emotions, thoughts, memories, actions, you know, um, it be, it plants pretty deep and, and we don't have very many other periods in our life that do that. And yes, you're going to go to a concert if you're, you know, if you're a Rolling Stones fan and, you know, you're, you know, and that's what you're listening to, you know, you're going to be listening to the Rolling Stones at, you know, 70, just like you did yeah. at 12. It's like, you know, it's like, you know, that would, you know, just like you, you're, so you're, you're, you're not alone. It's very... and, and, and it's such, it's such a cool way to think about it. And, you know, what I, what I often, what I challenge my students to understand. So we have our, our hearing science course at the university and I challenge them to think about this question, which is, how is it? You've all experienced that. I say to them, you know, you're driving down the street and all of a sudden a song comes on the radio and you start to cry because it instantly brings memory of your, you know, your ex boyfriend or girlfriend. Like, what is that? What, what is that about? And so we take the semester to really explore the entire process of how sound and music and experiences come together. And of course, they're richer because they activate not just the hearing part, not just the, the rhythmic, the pragmatic mm -hmm. part, but they also start to engage in the limbic system and the memory and the emotion. And that really, mm -hmm. that's where strong, deep memory really comes into play when you, when it's multifaceted. Yeah, absolutely. Yours, absolutely. I'd, I'd, I'd like to sit in on your class one day. It sounds like <laughs> a good one, but you know, and there's a, you know, there's a fun, um, you know, there's a story I tell in the book and I, there's an exercise I give to people. And I even did this at the dining room table at um, Thanksgiving. But, but, you know, I tell about a 12 year old boy named Daniel and he goes to me to talk to his grandfather who's ailing, you know, and in his later years and got not long to live. And, and they strike, try to strike up a conversation, which we've it's probably familiar to many people listening. And then, you know, the boy says, Hey, grandpa, you know, how you feeling? And grandpa says, Oh, not so good. And, you know, grandpa says, you know, how's football going? And Daniel says, I, you know, I don't play football. I play basketball, grandpa. <laughs> and the conversation just doesn't go very far, you know, but, you know, so suddenly, so what I, what I share and offer for him to do and what he did in this case, and what I offer for people to think about in their, you know, conversations at a dinner table over the holidays or whenever they're, you know, together. So I said, you know, just ask him a couple of these kind of questions. So I would ask him, you know, what was your and grandma's favorite song when you got married? And suddenly, and then what did you listen to when you were my age? You know, and suddenly, Powerful. again, the conversation, not just about music, changes the emotional and intellectual landscape. That's a because he goes back to sharing something that he'll remember because somebody has opened the gate and he'll be able to share really deeply emotional things, even if he's not a good social, emotional communicator with, with us. It's someone who would never know to ask those questions that he's going to get to, right? What a beautiful exercise to really help bring out the conversation, the the open lines of communication with people who are dealing with either mild cognitive impairment or even more advanced stages <clears throat> of dementia. So that's a that's a beautiful story. I appreciate you sharing that. And I know it's going to touch a lot of people when they hear that. And and as you said, you know, what amplifiedbook.com, right? You can actually go, you can get your copy of the book. You can read about the influence and the power of music and how it influences our lives every day, how it influences our brain. So uh, great work. Tell me a little bit. So you have this sort of unique perspective and we hinted at this earlier. So yes, you're, you're, you're obsessed with sound. You're a musician, right? Music flows through you. It's obvious. What is your, your outlook when it comes to the concept of now losing hearing and hearing loss and restoring that, that ability? I mean, you've written, whether it be books or, or in newspapers, I mean, this is a, a topic that you've been studying for years now, and not as an audiologist, not as a neuroscientist, but coming from a totally different perspective. 
Well, yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. So let me, <laughs> um, <laughs> that's okay. Uh, and I appreciate the plug on the book. So let me back up a little bit in terms of let's just in sound. So I do in the book actually cover a chapter on sound because people ask me all the time and I go, and it's, it's obviously the essence of music. And I think when, before we look at the decline of, you know, uh, our auditory system, as we age, I think it's important to look at our experience of sound in, in our development, right? So, and I, you know, I I believe that this is the decade it's going to change. You know, I've, I've quoted about this, you know, the decade of sound or whatever yeah. that we're going to become much more conscious of our of um, what's taking place of auditory input because most everything we get is going to shift to auditory input yeah. and measuring for wolf, which we'll talk about in a minute. But you know, as you said before, and I say, you know, you know in the book is, you, you know, to be very conscious of your sonic diet. Like, we, you know, as you said, you know, you can close your eyes, but your ears don't turn off. It's not just that you, they don't turn off, but we, our consciousness around our ears mm -hmm. is that probably the lowest of all our senses. So if you touch something hot, you're going to pull your hand back. <laughs> you know, if you taste something rancid, you're going to spit it out. If you look at something you don't want to see, you're going to block your eyes. If you, you know, smell something horrible, you're going to turn your head, but your ears and the brain has this way to adapt to sound yes. that as soon as it identifies it as something that's non-threatening, because that's its job constantly, is hearing, 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 threatening, threatening, no, threatening, yes, threatening, hearing, hearing, <laughs> yeah. threatening, no. And that's all happening in the background without you being conscious of it. And when you, so when you operate with that unconsciousness, you start to be, become desensitized to your environment because the brain has this way to attenuate the things that aren't going to kill you. But those, all of those elements, whether it's the construction down the street or, you know, you know, um, just, you know, low level audio that's affecting the brain or, you know, music that's blaring in the, in the background that you're trying to drown out or, you know, li or lyrics of songs that you don't think are, you're processing, but your brain is processing. All of these things, this lack of, um, of training and consciousness around hearing it's probably one of the hugest things that we could do rise raise to help hearing and sound in the development of the human being. Okay. So that we're not just dealing with the problem set on the back end of, okay, somebody, why is somebody's hearing, you know, gone bad? Um, you know, we're not, we're dealing with much deeper, richer human issues around hearing, which is the capacity to listen. The, you know, capacity the capacity to, to stay involved, the capacity to communicate, the capacity to be part of a community. Right. The capacity to connect to one another because it's so it's so um, integral to our to our nature and to our system and to our sense of human connection and security. I mean, we recognize we have this tremendous hearing system of where we can basically recognize. I don't know how many ranges of human voices like the different. So you all, you know. You just have to pick up the phone. And if you know that person, you pretty much know <laughs> within a few words of who they are, you know, um, if you're speaking to them regularly. And, and if your mother picks up the phone and is talking to you, you can tell her how you're doing. And if you're lying, she's going to say you're lying <laughs> because she can hear, hear also in your voice, your well-being, your exactly. health. Exactly. That's your, why you, you can't know. lie to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> so so um, being conscious of these and, and actually managing our sonic diet, whether it be with noise, whether it be. You know, I walk into environments all the time. You know, I'm an HSP, so I have this heightened sensitivity and this training in sound. So I can't tell you how many places I walk into and the sound, like, toxicity oh. that people are totally unaware of that's going on, but they're tuned out to it because of this desensitivity that they've been practiced and that, in general, our society has basically bought into. So, you know, we don't. Oh, it's, it's, a, I mean, the thing is, is if you, and if you look at the actual, just getting into, I love your word of sound toxicity. If you get into some of the original research for which governments around the world have set noise guidelines and whether it be occupationally, recreationally, all these guidelines, they're all based on right on on broken data or they're all based on data that that allows for a certain percentage of people to really be harmfully affected and results in hearing loss i mean there's just such flaws i do hope uh, i'm with you 
uh, if there's a rally to attend, please let me know to really help bring down, <laughs> right. you know, the sound toxicity. Uh, I think right. that there are some European countries that are really leading the way with this. I'll, I'll never forget. I went to um, Disneyland in, in Paris and every employee who was working on a ride, I'm guessing they had to wear hearing protection. Right. Right. I didn't even right. think it was that loud. But they had to wear hearing protection. And then, you know, you come over here and it's just, whoa. I mean, everywhere I go, I'm just like, I mean, I call it job security, but it's not right. a good thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and, and, and we're basically just measuring dB, right? We're just controlling one right. aspect of sound. So we're not controlling like a lot of frequency levels, oh. like listening to hard drives spinning in an office all day or, or, exactly. you know, things that actually are creating, um, or, you know, we can get into the, you know, to audio itself and the resolution of audio. You know, we're, we're just constantly yeah, listening if I, to if two, I could use 2D your, low resolution audio. And if I could use your analogy. in the gaps, right? Oh, definitely. Absolutely. And if I could use your analogy, the, the concept of, you know, the sound diet, right? I mean, our ears for however long us humans have been on this planet, it's only the last hundred 120 years that things have started getting really loud. Our ears were not designed. They did not evolve to live in this, you know, post-industrial revolution world where everything is just overbearing. Yes. And we're listening to, I mean, there's some great studies on, you know, um, and hopefully a lot more will be coming out in the next year or two is, you know, about you know, the audio we listen to. So we didn't grow up in unnatural environments where we listen to recorded and audio like we're doing now. That's yes. basically, you know, this is, you know, gotten a lot better, but it's in 2D frequencies are cut off. The brain's filling in the gaps. It's the brain's trying to spatially orient us to each other and where we are in a room together. It, we're not conscious of it. It's not throwing us off in our conversation, but at the same time, the brain is doing so much processing to deal with you know, digital distortion and gaps that it's hearing and MP3 audio and just things like, I mean, we, I don't want to go down that path, <laughs> but it's, so it's not just noise. Um, it's, it's just the environment that we are is very un, still unnatural to our system and we're not a, a conscious of it. So bringing our consciousness to it just helps is going to help for more longevity and brain health because those things over time, you know, we'll, we'll wear out the tires on the car, you know, it's just, <laughs> You know, even if we don't I, notice I, I first off love that analogy. My analogy has always been, you know, living with all this damage in your ears. You think it's right. just hearing loss. You think it's ear related. It's like driving 60 miles an hour in second gear, right? You're wearing right. down the gears of your brain and it's causing real damage, which, so this is where I want to sort of, you know, circle Move back up. to, because you've had, I, I mean, you've prolifically written about what's happening in terms of Congress. And, and I mean, the title, right, from, from White House to Walmart. Uh, I love that article, <laughs> right, right where, the, where the hearables right. are heating up. I mean, right. you, got some, you got some catchy art, uh, titles there. I have to commend you for that. But what has been your, I'm just, I want to I wanna put you in the category of an outsider. And what I mean by that is not being an audiologist. Uh, right. And that's all I mean by that. Uh, but right. what has been your take on the changes that are happening, good, bad, or otherwise, in terms of increasing access to to technology? Right. Well, I'm going to approach it from um, increasing access to technology is going to is going to be awesome, and there's going there's problems. So we can get into the problems if you want. But you know, in terms of you know. Um, not having audiologists on hand, we can talk about how that those solutions and and for the audiologists and practitioners themselves, how do they move forward in this world? Yeah. We can come back to that. But in terms of for me, um, you know, and one thing that you know, I've trained a lot of teams at Singularity University, um, you know, and 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 working with exponential technologies to have impact, and you know, been with exponential medicine on the faculty there for since. I think 2014, but, you know, one of the things we've learned in big transformation in, in sectors or industries or whatever you, is that um, it, the biggest changes always come from someone from the outside. So I'm not saying that I'm the person that's going to change your in industry, but because when we're so trained in a particular way to look at hearing, to look at a certain medical space, to look at, then we're, we're, there's opportunities that can take place that 
we're trained not to see, like our hearing attenuate, you know, attenuates what right. we're, what right. might kill us <laughs> or won't kill us. So the um, and um, so you know around you know when I started on the faculty of um, with exponential medicine, the reason I chose that track out of all the ex- exponential technologies is because I saw such incredible potential of what can be done at the intersection of wellness, technology, health, and you know, wellness. And and when it came to um, the development of those exponential technologies, nanotechnology, you know. Um, you know, biotech, all these different areas um, of, uh, you know, sensors, you know, um, all these things that we can, you know, it just became very clear to me that that we're going to be able to make these micro super processors that we can put um, some, you know, some people say chips in the body. I don't think we need to do chips in the body. I think, sure. you know, that and so now jumping, you know, seven years forward, we now have all those technologies available and we can get more you know, biometric sensor data out of your ear than most hospital rooms can with their standard machines, you know, from, so from, so the, the combination of that and the combination of that, um, of the biometric measurements and that we'll be able to get and the combination of, you know, what we can do with things in the ears with input, you know, and correction and personalization now of, of the human ear, because, um, take us to a level of advancement moving forward that it's, I, you know, I don't even want to use the word exponential because I just use it like three times, but it's just, <laughs> it's just, le- you know, light yes. years ahead. Leaps and bounds. Any, yes. Every any, synonym any, you know, for can, exponential. You know, we're still in the fifties basically in terms of what we're doing uh, in sixties of terms of what we're using and how we're practicing, you know, our practices. And it's not a criticism. It's, it's a great opportunity. It's so, an opportunity. Yes. So, and, you know, and now we look at um, once we have these, you know, beautiful high fidelity audio devices with full of you know, robust biometric sensors and these closed loop systems with our supercomputers, we'll be able to, um, and personalization because nobody's hearing is the same. So we've, right. ne- we've negated that for years. We've measured it on this, <laughs> which, which frequency are they not hearing well and which one are they hearing? And let's fix, try to fix that. I mean, that's not really stupid. Adapting. You can say it. It's stupid. I, I agree. <laughs> it's, 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 it's narrow. <laughs> All right, fine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's probably, it's, it's, it's pretty short sighted. So we know we have to go much further than that. We know we have to increase their capacity to understand, to hear in spatialized ways and, you know, fully dimensional ways, I should say. To, um, and, and, to, and then we're going to have these closed loop systems where at any time you'll be able to look at your, you know, your supercomputer, your phone, just like you would with your Aura Ring if you use something like that or something. They have a software and it's going to tell you whatever was going into your ears at any time and what it was doing to a number of your biometrics. And that could be, and just about everything would be going into your ear. So you'll know, you know, whether when you talk to your mother-in-law on the phone last week that that spiked your blood pressure, your heart rate, or whether, you know, whatever it did. And then you'll know what music you listened to, how that affected your, your, your nervous system and, and your um, EEG and all these different areas. And so you'll be able to basically, and you'll to see this map of how the audio world is totally affecting your well-being, right. your psychological and physical state. So to me, that's that's. I mean, I get excited about it. You can tell. I mean, that's that's awesome. And I know by watching the development of these technologies and where they're going, where they're getting cheaper, 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 smaller, 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 smaller more powerful, and and you have the, and you can create these closed loop systems where we're going to have music and audio as, as precision personalized medicine. You know, and to me, um, this is a complete game changer because most of the, you know, um, in our, at least for your audience, they look at these things. But for most of the health and wellness <laughs> world, which is a pretty big one, they don't look at them. And we, you know, we have the capacity to do COVID tests through audio. We have the capacity to do all these different things that we can do through audio when you combine voice analytics. And we, you know, and you pick those up in the great place to pick up voices in the ears, you know, or or in something set in the ears. And so I just think when we bring that back to, you know, where we are with helping people with hearing, that we're going to have many more options to help people not just improve the dB of certain frequencies of their hearing where they've had a gap, 
but to completely change their state of physical and psychological health. And that's where I think some of the confusion in in, in my field has been, you know, who's who's this 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 Frank guy? Why is Frank <laughs> pushing over the counter hearing aids? He doesn't understand the services we provide. And really what it's about is the power that we can now unleash with the deregulation of hearing aids being controlled by, you know, this this government entity, the way they're distributed, the way that they're prescribed. I still, right, I still believe that that you need that hearing healthcare provider, that the widget at this point today, the widget is right, is limited in how much it can do. You need the guidance of a hearing healthcare professional in some shape or form. But the future, the deregulation is really what's going to drive the future of hearing technology and incorporating it, incorporating it into more than just hearing better, but actually living a better life. Absolutely, Keith. And that and we're talking there for the patients. I also think there's going to be tremendous opportunity for the professionals, the, you know, the, the, the audiologists. I think it's going to be a game changer for yes. those that um, who are committed basically in this, you know, to helping people improve their health through the aspect of sound and hearing, because they're going to be able to reach, you know, 10x, if not 100x more people who now today don't have access, we're going to have much better advanced technologies because of the, you know, in terms of, especially around the personalization, you know, of, you know, devices um, in people's ears, because right now we're pretty, we're still a little ways from that. And, um, and so I, and, and I believe me, I'm, I, I, I think that there's tremendous value in the, in the uh, audiologists and the, and the different people in the profession and the models that I see going forward that are going to be most successful, and we're going to go back and forth, people are going to try to do these completely AI, self-service. Well, you know, if anybody knew anybody over 50 during COVID, that didn't work very well. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and they, those will get better, and those will help yes. um, audiologists in, and, 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 and practitioners of all um, to be able to focus on what they're actually there to focus on. You know, it's just the, the human we, health we have, and the human being, you know. We have a problem. The problem is there are 50 million people in this country, and I still believe it's an underestimate. There are 50 million people in our country, 500 million people worldwide, and less than 20% of them have access to proper hearing health care, to proper hearing technology. There are way too many people sitting on the sidelines not understanding the importance of hearing. And I think that you telling your story from your viewpoint of how important sound and music and, and the future with all the biometric markers and the analysis that can go on, it's you're an inspiration, Frank. I appreciate everything that you're doing and the awareness that you're bringing to what I consider the most important of all of our senses. Well, absolutely. I appreciate the work you're doing. And, and I, and I, you know, my, my goal is to actually raise the, the bar and the opportunity for the practitioners, you know, that I don't see that. I don't see them as separate. I know some people see it as separated, but I don't really see it as separated. Um, I you. think it's, um, so that's really, you know, and hybrid models and, and being able to treat and help many more people as a practitioner are what I believe are the opportunity and for the practitioner as well to be able to create a sustainable, even a sustainable business model where they're not strapped into a system where they're just a clog in the wheel. Of course. Having to go through a certain set of antiquated, you know, tools and practices where only certain people can come in the other side. So there's kind of a closed gate on both sides or very, you know, choked gate on both sides for, um, as you know, for the practitioners to be able to do their work and to make a living from it and for the patients to get to their services. So yeah. I'm, you know, on the service side, aside from the technology, I, I see that there's going to be great opportunity. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Frank, I'm, we're going to, we're going to leave it there. I already took more of your time than I promised you I would. Thank you That's so right. much. I, I, Thank you. This has been a great conversation. It's really, I, it's been ear opening to me. I think that many of the listeners out there are going to get a ton of information. There's a really 
I, I'm nothing but optimistic uh, for the field of hearing healthcare. You are doing great work. Uh, I, I know I wanted to ask you more about your nonprofit. We'll put links to that uh, in the YouTube page, in the in the description for the podcast, because you're really, you're doing a lot of stuff. And, and thank you for everything you do. I got to ask you one personal question, though, if that's okay. All right. Absolutely. So um, I normally ask people what their favorite movie is, but for you, I have to ask you, who's your favorite composer? Oh, uh, that's a really tough one. <laughs> I knew it would be. <laughs> that's like asking a chef his favorite food. Um, you know, it, it depends genre and era. So Beethoven among the classics, um, uh, you know, among the at least the romantic area of the classics. Um, you know, I had the blessing of working with one of the great, great, great film composers for many years, George De La Rue. He mm-hmm. did some 400 films, all the films of Truffaut and many films, you know. So he was a great composer, um, you know, of the contemporaries in the film world. I could go on and on. Oh, it, so, have, have, okay, fine. If, I, if, I, if it's too yeah. difficult, if, if we're, if this was too, you know, how about favorite movie? Is that one easier? <laughs> no. Again, I, again, I put everything in context. So, so it's kind of like with music. So people like uh, you know, I I look at, at, at an integrated intelligence approach to pieces, life, right, and health. So for music, I look at music as as you'll see and you've read in the book as a component of everything you can do. You want to do in your life better. Like if you want to win the Olympics, you want to meditate better. You want to focus more. You want to do so. Um, so I, for me, movies all have, all have context. You know, I think the one that I, you know, that puts both of them together that everyone should see that was out just recently is, you know, the Aretha Franklin story, you know, unbelievable, but there's yeah, but many, many more beautiful. Absolutely. Well, Frank, thank you for your great work. Thank you for all your do. Uh, you are a great person and thank you for, for your time today. So have a great day and take care. Thanks, Keith. It's really been my pleasure, and and I hope that your audience got something useful out of this, and happy to come back if you need more.